Now, every one of us here tonight knows that there's something wrong inside. We have a tendency within us that disturbs us. We long for victory over sin, sins of thought and word and deed. And the Bible reveals that we are born radically wrong. We are members of a human race that has turned its back upon God. There's something inside that makes it easier to go wrong than to go right. And some deep evil seems to sap the human race. There's a bias in the bowl that takes it off course. There's a gravity that pulls us down when we want to rise high in spiritual attainment. And the secret is that something within us has died. The spiritual part of our being that God gave us has died because of sin. This is the reason why we can neither see nor enter the kingdom of heaven unless there is a radical change. And here is a great revelation from Holy Scripture, and we also know it in our own experience, that we cannot make this radical change ourselves. That God says you must have, you must know, you must experience if you are ever to see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Why the cross? Because on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was made sin for you. He bore your sin, sir, in his body on the tree. He was the only man who ever went through hell on earth. And he did it for you, to cleanse you from the stain of sin, to deliver you from the power of sin, to clear you from the penalty of sin, so that there could be nothing between you and God. Christ Jesus bore your sin in his body on the tree. So, ladies and gentlemen, we come to this great conclusion tonight, that unless God is willing to do something about it, we are sunk, and there is no hope of us ever entering or seeing the kingdom of heaven. But here is the Christian gospel, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the good news, that God loves us. Because he loves us, he's willing, he's yearning to undertake this great change for us, if only we are willing. And because Christ has died and risen again, I have wonderful news for you here tonight. Hundreds of you here yearn to know what it is to be in the kingdom of God. Hundreds of you want to know the victory that God gives to those that belong to Christ. If you will repent, believe and confess, God will do the rest. He will come into your cleansed being that he now possesses and he will live his life in you. He will give you eternal life, divine life. Right now you will enter the kingdom of heaven and you will live in the kingdom of heaven whilst you're on earth. And when death comes, it won't be death. You'll be with Christ and you'll go into the glories of eternal heaven. That is what God will do for you tonight if you will repent and believe and confess it. Wow, that is some crazy good preaching, right? I mean, come on. And that video is so cool because it just shows you some visuals and starts to help you think about the biblical truths that we have in the Word of God and what we're studying this week, but just to let you visualize and to see it in a different way. And that's what I want to do is we study this very familiar verse, John 3, 16. I want you to grasp it, to memorize it, to meditate on that God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this, this my friends, is a challenge to believe, that there is this great, mighty, good, incredible God. God that loves you and loves me and it doesn't change. It's this unconditional love. It's this agape love that God gives and sacrifices. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about today. How love gives. Love is this action that God has given to the world and he has displayed his love for you and for me. You know, oftentimes this is really important to define and to understand because when we think of love, we really use it when we're referring to like feelings. It's an emotion for us, right? Not necessarily an action. We think of like, well, I love Skittles when we really should say I like Skittles. Well, I know some of you really love Skittles, right? But we often say in like in, in, in language, we, we, we fall out of love. No, you lose a feeling and so you don't feel like doing something and it causes you not to act. But love has this action. 
In fact, when we go to God's Word, He gives us great descriptions of what love is. Love is not just a feeling, but it is an action. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is a, a chapter that sort of defines love, this agape love that we're talking about, this love that God gives to us. It says in verse 4 through 8 that love, well, love is patient and it is kind. Love does not, bo- or does not, uh, is not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It, it does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or, or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is the type of love that we are trying to study and meditate and process with our little six pound human brains. We're trying to understand God's love. Let's pray and let's ask God to give us this revelation. God, we thank you so much that we can come to you now and we pray, Lord, that you would give revelation, that, Lord, we would be challenged to believe in this type of love, that we could have love in you. Help us to see that you are a God of action, that you are a God that serves, that you are a God that is for us and not against us. And, Lord, we thank you so much for defining this love. We pray, Lord, that we would live this love out today. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Man. Amen. You know, when we think about love, we need to be thinking about Jesus, right? As we study God's Word, we always want to look to Jesus. And even 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what we just read about how we define love, Jesus actually fulfills the definition of love. He is a giver. He is a generous God. You know, you could literally fill in the blank when it says that love is patient. You can say Jesus is patient, that Jesus is kind. He, he doesn't boast. He's not arrogant or rude. He doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. He, he does the right thing. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He, he believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. You know, if you put your faith in Jesus, you will not be disappointed because he will never fail. And so we are getting our definitions of what love is, and it should spark uh, this passion and zeal and worship and adoration towards Jesus because He is the one that gave us this John 3.16 and told us He came down from heaven to earth to share what God's will was and His word and His way. And He says that God has an unconditional agape love for you and for me. And so we praise Jesus, and Jesus displayed this love to us, not just with definitions and with words. No, my friends, He came seeking and saving to save the lost. You know, the Bible says that sin separates us from a relationship with God, from actually experiencing love with God, that all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But Romans 6, 23 says, but man, the gift of God is eternal life. Because Jesus gave something that you and I couldn't give. He gave Himself. He bore our sin and proved His love by action. He proved that we can be forgiven by rising from the dead and having eternal life. And I love that God isn't so proud that He wouldn't display His love for you and me. In fact, He's actually so great and loving and gracious and humble that He specifically rose again so we would never question that He can act and He is powerful. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20 says. It says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but power. See, our God displays love with power. He, he displays love with action. He does what He says, and He says He loves us, so we can look at God's kingdom and His ways and see how love is displayed. And God is happy to display this love for you and me, because He wants us to know Him. The Bible says this is good news, that He gave His only Son, that whoever would believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. He gave. He gave. 1 John 4, 9, we talked about this yesterday and read the verse, but He manifested His love by sending His Son. He proved, He showed, He gave, and there was action and sacrifice to His love. It wasn't just a mere feeling. It wasn't just talk. He displayed that love and that power, the ways of His kingdom, by sacrificing and giving of Himself. Jesus says this, John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You know, the Bible does say that God is love. 
But God does not just love you because He has to. God loves us because He wants to. He calls us friend. He likes you. He cares about you. He even tells you to pray for Him and cast your cares upon Him for He cares for you. He, he, he knows you. He adores you. He made you. He formed you. He has a purpose and plan for you. God loves you that He gave, that He displayed, that He made a way that we can have a relationship with Him and He displayed this sacrificial love. And there's something so special about the cross of Christ. Theologians say it's this great exchange. It's where God died for our sin and did something that we could not do, earn salvation. Many of us are struggling. We're trying to earn love and approval, but God says, no, no, no. You're already approved. You're already loved. I'm going to display that, and I'm going to take your place. 1 Peter 2.24 says this about the cross. For he himself bore our sins, speaking of Jesus, in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that for our sake, He, speaking of God, made Jesus, Him, to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus didn't deserve death, but He stepped in humility to take our place so that in Him, it says, we might become the righteousness of God. There was this great exchange. Jesus took our sin, but we were able to take His righteousness. And the Bible says now all spiritual blessings are found in Him because He gave grace. And we are saved by grace because God gave. We received this. God could have left us in our sin, but He didn't. He could have left us dead, but He gave and He loved and He displayed His world. He displayed His love to the world on the cross of Christ. Because His love is defined by action. And so God says you can't earn this type of love, but I'll give it to you. You can receive it. Don't you love that our God is a generous God? That He's a gracious God? That He's full of grace? Oftentimes, I don't think we comprehend and take the time to think about it. Because just as we take for granted Bible verses, we take for granted this life. You see, the Bible says that the reason why you and I are breathing right now is because God has given us the gift of breath. That our bodies just work. That He made us by His grace and sustains us by His grace. That He is a life giver and in his mercy he is generous towards us and gives us grace and he calls us to be his people and to respond to this grace and to love the world as he loves he gives us a definition he says i want you now to respond to enjoy my grace to receive this grace to not take it for granted and to love me and love other people you know it's the second highest command The Bible tells us Jesus summed up all the law just to love him and to love other people. And this is the love that he describes, this sacrificial love. God not only displayed it for us to receive it, but also to give it to others, to the world. He wants to use people like you and me to actually make disciples, to live on mission, and to live for him and display this type of love. In fact, if we forget that we're to love people and to love God, The Bible says we're missing the whole point of life. 1 Corinthians had the definition, but right before then in verses 1 through 3 in chapter 13, it says this, If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noising gong, a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I have, And if I deliver up my body to be buried, but have not love, I gain nothing. We are to love. We are made in the image of God, and we're to receive God's love and to display God's love to others. Jesus, in fact, told us in Acts 20, 35, that it is better to give than to receive. See, we need to to come biblically of how to live this life and what love is. God loved us, but now He wants us to love others, and it's with this agape love. This love of action, this generous love, because this type of love transforms and changes people's lives. It has a great, incredible impact. 1 John 2 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins, meaning God was fully pleased by the sacrifice that Jesus gave because Jesus gave and poured out love. 
And God was pleased by that. And He's not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. God just didn't die for you and me. He died for everyone. And God now wants us to join Him in loving others. That's right. I know it's hard, but He wants us to do this. And He believes that we can do this through the power of His Holy Spirit. That Christ died for all, and He wants us to love all people. You know, Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5, tells us how to do this and defines how we are to love people. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine if the entire world loved like this? Could you imagine what the school would be like right now, Lake Worth Christian School, if we loved like this? Or your family, or your community, or this city, or this world? It is life-changing love. It is a supernatural love that God invites us and challenges us to love people. Yes, to love people in class, to love our enemies, to love people on social media, to love all people that disagree about us. What would it look like if we put others first? Let me ask you a personal question. How can you love people like this today? How, how can you sacrificially uh, give your life to others? Serve others. You want to be great in the kingdom? Serve. It makes a huge difference. What does that practically look like for you to love? You know, I will share a little bit about my story. This type of love changed my life. I'm so passionate about uh, this generous sacrificial love because I saw that love displayed in others and I was changed. I grew up in the church. Just like you, I was around things of God, hearing chapel services, Bible studies, youth group, those type of things, but God was not Lord of my life. I, I, I mentally said, well, is He worth living for? What, what is my life worth it? Maybe I'll give later. I don't really know. These are nice words, but where's the action? I, I just didn't see it. I just didn't know it. I was, I was wayward. I was just back and forth. I didn't really know how to really live for God and really think that that was important until I saw other people my own age, teenagers like you, love God and love other people. I went on a first mission trip to Mexico. And they were memorizing this very passage that we just read, for, uh, Philippians chapter 2, about having the mind of Christ and, and putting others first. And I saw that them do that not only with me, but with themselves. Sure, you may want to love the new person at school, and that's sort of natural because you want to be kind. Okay, whatever. But they, I saw them fight and argue, and I saw them disagree, but then I saw them forgive and love and sacrifice and serve one another. Jesus said, well, they'll know we're Christians by our love for one another. And that radically transformed my life because I realized God was real. That, that, that God was a God of action and He had transformed these teenagers' lives to love one another and love me that I could be transformed and I can receive this love. And it was then when God put it in my heart to teach the Bible, to become a pastor, to say, you know what? God is real. I'm seeing God work in their lives, God work in my life. Don't I, I share this story because I want you never to underestimate the power of love and especially loving at this age. Don't think that you have to be 18 or 21 or 50 years old to live this life and have a great impact. No, the reason that I'm even teaching the Bible is because other teenagers like yourself actually love people in an environment. And when we are at Lake Worth Christian School, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student, if we're loving one another, it can make a significant impact on other people's lives. You know, Jesus told us this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light in to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, when we are actually loving God and loving other people, it makes a significant difference. How do we do this? 
by God's grace, receiving it and displaying it and giving it to others. We, we need to do this to make a significant impact in the world. And I believe that we can. God loves us and we know what that type of love is. And when we're transformed and receive that love, He gives us a plan and a purpose to now go and transform the nations. You can make a difference in a purpose and a plan. We are saved by God's grace, but Ephesians 2.10 tells us He has predestined us to walk in His purpose and it makes a significant difference. So the challenge isn't, isn't just to try hard or do better, but first to receive love and ask God to strengthen you and to, to, to receive the generous goodness of God and then ask God to allow that to flow to other people. Do you believe that? Can you walk in those ways? I pray that you can because when you do, it will make a significant impact. It made a significant impact in my life and it will make a significant impact in this world today. And so what I want to do is something a little bit different as we close our time together. As we're thinking about the cross and the sacrificial love and just asking God to use us, I want to respond by just praying with some music and just meditating a little bit and walking you through some, some guided prayers. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that we can, re -res we can respond to your love. I pray, God, that as we respond and meditate that how much you loved us, Lord, that we would come to you in humility and ask for your grace. You know, in this time that we're just reflecting on God's love and how he gave for us, can I ask you a question? As you're in the posture of prayer, have you received God's love? Have you received the grace of salvation? Are you saved today? The Bible says that today is the day of salvation and you can be. Maybe you're around things of God, but maybe you're trying to earn God's love. Maybe you're trying to earn God's approval or earn eternal life. The Bible says the only way you can be saved is just receiving it by faith, through grace. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I wanna give this opportunity to respond and confess with your mouth. If that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, you've never given your heart to Him and believe, I challenge you right now to just do that and receive His grace. Say, Jesus, I turn to you. I believe that you died and rose again. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Spirit. Help me to follow you. Help me to love other people. The Bible says that when you turn to God in that way, with the posture of believing and confessing with your mouth, you are saved and we rejoice with you. I would encourage you to tell someone today the decision you made. But still there is another group that is listening to this, that is we are in a posture of prayer still. As we're bowing our heads before the Lord, as we're seeking God and asking God to help us, there's another group that, that may be saved, but Jesus is not their Lord. Maybe you were like me, that you, you were th around things of God, but you didn't fully put your faith in the Lord. Let me ask you, are you following God in His ways? I want to give you an opportunity today to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit by asking God for help. It's hard to love people when we can ask God to help us to love people. The Bible says He gives grace to those that are humble, that we can ask. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 11, 9 through 13, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if your son asks for a fish, will instead of fish give him a serpent? And if he asks for an egg, and will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You know, let's ask God for help. The Bible says we can ask to be filled with His Spirit and empowered and we can surrender our lives to Him and by use for, for Him. And so if that's you today, just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I come to you for help. I ask that you would fill me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your strength and love to love others. I make you Lord of my life. Rule and reign in my heart. As we pray these prayers, God, we thank you that we can come to you. And I pray that this message was life-changing for those that are listening. I thank you so much, God, for people's hearts. Continue to challenge us to believe in these truths. And we thank you, God, for your generous love. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that this message and these chapel times have been challenging to you, have been life-changing to you, and that you're reminded once again today that God loves you. I cannot wait until tomorrow as we continue to talk through John 3.16.